Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Alliance for PE Pipe Roadshow webinar. Today, we are discussing above ground or above grade applications for HDPE pipe. We all know polyethylene is the material of choice for uh, above ground installations due to its indefinite UV resistance, but we're going to get into a lot of detail uh, about the chemical properties of poly that, that make it so great for above ground applications and some of the specific design requirements for when you are installing polyethylene above ground. We've got a great group of presenters for you today, but as always, want to take care of a few things before we introduce them. We always want to thank our members. These companies fund our operation. They make uh, putting on programs like this possible. If you are buying polyethylene pipe fittings or equipment, you want to buy from these manufacturers to ensure that you get the best products available. The Alliance has a great website, pepipe.org. Uh, we have a very robust case study database on that website. Uh, we're also very active on social media, over 15,000 followers on these three platforms, plus Instagram combined. We see the most action on LinkedIn, but Go ahead and follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We are posting every single day. Here's that website again. So that case study database I was talking about looks like this. Uh, searchable by project type, by geographical location. So if you are considering a municipal water or wastewater polyethylene project, chances are you can find somebody nearby who's done something similar in the past. Uh, we're updating this database constantly. If you have a project you feel belongs in the database, go ahead, shoot me an email. We have a very simple form we ask you to fill out, send us a couple pictures, and we will have one of our interns write the actual case study for you. A couple more programs we have coming up here in March. Uh, one week from today, we will be live from Tulsa, Oklahoma, highlighting some McElroy butt fusion equipment. Peter, good afternoon. How are you today? Hey, Drew. Great to be here. Yeah, so that McElroy event next week, uh, we've had a good turnout so far. We'd love to solicit some more participation, though. Uh, we're going to talk about the history of butt fusion, Drew, dating back to the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, and then we're going to talk about um, how McElroy approaches the whole butt fusion process with their various gear, uh, their butt fusion equipment, as well as their productivity tools. Pretty interesting talk. And Drew, we're going to do that live down in Tulsa. Live from Tulsa, Oklahoma. If you didn't hear it the first two times, there it is once more. Uh, we're pretty excited about it because we are, <laughs> we're going to be showcasing some new equipment. We're going from their smallest machines up to one of their largest machines. Uh, I think that's going to be a really cool show. And then Peter, the, the following week, we're uh, presenting as part of ASCE, our second uh, feature with that organization. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about that program? Sure, Drew. We're pleased to partner with Corin Maine on that one. And so uh, we're doing six different ASCE events across the year. You can sign up on their website or ours. Uh, this one, uh, Alan uh, is working on, it's a spotlight on innovation. So it's everything, uh, the background of the resin and the pipe on what really makes it uh, do all the things that we love to talk about on this, on this program, Drew, uh, as well as its ability to handle uh, chlorine, uh, how these uh, evolutions in the resin and the pipe manufacturer have contributed to its becoming the great pipe that it is. Great, yeah. So once again, if you want to register for these programs, do it the same way you registered for today. Go to pepipe.org. A couple more resources we offer for everybody. We always want to plug our engineers package. This is a great collection of uh, design guidelines, uh, the Alliance's model specifications, our standard details, as well as the Plastic Pipe Institute's Handbook for Polyethylene Pipe. Uh, if you are working with poly, designing with poly, you want this package of documents. This is a great resource for you. It's on the website. You could also shoot me an email, dmuller at pepipe.org, and I will send it to you. The Poly Podcast has been a fun project for you. We're getting more and more listeners uh, as we keep putting these out. Uh, our most recent episode from last week, we sat down with uh, Richard Brand from East Windsor Municipal Utility Authority and Eric Schaefer from Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, both those guys are in communities where they're using poly 
uh, exclusively for new water and wastewater installations. And uh, they gave us some great info about how their choice of polyethylene has impacted their community. So check out the Poly Podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts or whatever other program you use uh, for your podcasts. Give it a listen. Finally, Peter, do you want to come back on and introduce our fine selection of uh, speakers for today? Yeah, so the primary today is Alan Ambler. So the people, about half the people uh, that are on this call, Drew, uh, have seen Alan speak before. He's, he's quite knowledgeable on the topic. Uh, he has his own firm, AM Trenchless, uh, wrote the book on uh, uh, pipe bursting, uh, along with some colleagues at uh, NASTT. And of course, Richard Colossa is a familiar name. Richard's an engineer with WL Plastics, chemical engineer, a lot of experience in the production of pipe as well as uh, resin earlier in his career. Uh, and then a popular guy, uh, I won't say that to his face, but Doug Keller with Lyondell. Uh, Doug has been a regular speaker in our physical roadshow program, Drew, uh, and has come on at various uh, sessions that we've done over the last year in the Roadshow Light program. We welcome Doug today. And then also Stephen Boros uh, uh, with Pipeline Plastics, uh, formerly with PPI. He's a wealth of knowledge uh, and we're happy to have and delighted to have Stephen with us again today. So welcome to our speakers. Um, and uh, with that, <clears throat> uh, who's, got, who's in charge of the deck, Drew? Uh, I am Peter. Your audio for a second oh, there. Great. Yep. Okay. So here is uh, how you all can contact us. Uh, you're welcome to communicate with any one of these individuals directly um, at any time for any reason. We would love it if you direct leads and uh, questions about projects to me or Drew, uh, but send them to anybody, whoever you feel comfortable with. We'll all get the information eventually. Um, okay. So. Alan, what's the next slide look like? Um, you know, when I think about um, above ground, you know, I've always thought about above ground in terms of um, wastewater bypasses. Uh, we've done a bunch of interesting case studies over the years, one on the Corsicana project from 2007 where they were running out of water. So they partnered with uh, Tarrant Regional water to run a temporary six mile, 16 inch diameter polyethylene line to save those residents, those 25,000 people. Polyethylene oftentimes is the save the day pipe. I'm also reminded of the one up in uh, Connecticut uh, where uh, Aquarian water had to tie two reservoirs together, together with uh, polyethylene. That was a 20 inch job, I believe, several miles above grade along the rights of way uh, and it saved uh, those towns. So we kind of become the save, save the day pipe over the years in many respects. And Alan, that's no more true than when we see uh, above ground installations uh, with wastewater bypasses, isn't it? isn't it? Absolutely. That was one of the items here, Peter, that really impressed me the most when assembling this deck um, is for large diameter rehabilitation projects, um, bypass, specifically wastewater bypass, is often more complicated to design than the actual rehab itself. So um, we have a, a really good showcase uh, uh, project for a very complex uh, bypass that brought all of these above ground elements together. So that, that I always enjoyed seeing. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So uh, I just wanted to highlight for our listening audience, Alan, before you get started, the, uh, the colleagues that are on this call, you know, we had over uh, 380 people sign up for this thing. And uh, just a quick look at the, your colleagues in the industry, at least on the municipal side, we didn't highlight the civil engineer, the consulting civils, but a lot of uh, cities are paying attention to polyethylene, much more so than, you know, even five years ago uh, in several of these cities are advocates for the product like Livonia, Michigan, East Windsor, Dallas is just experimenting with it. Chicago has an ordinance against anything other than some pipe types. Um, so glad to see them and Metropolitan Water Reclamation District interested in polyethylene. I mean, Tulsa ought to be more interested in it. Uh, they're still dealing with the February breaks uh, in their town uh, as they uh, come to terms with this whole issue of legacy pipe systems and our devotion to them. And then on the next slide, we look at some of the larger utilities, the regional districts, states, and counties 
that are paying close attention to polyethylene. Collier County, that's Naples on the west side of Florida has been experimenting with poly. They're beyond the pilot phase and are integrating it into their capital program. So Alan, you've got a lot of interest here uh, in polyethylene. And one of the things that I was surprised about and the reason we did this deck in this talk is because people kept asking us about installation issues related to above ground applications. Uh, and that's that's what we're here to talk about. So, all right. Good uh, luck. I, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to to collect this new information, and and I learned a lot about it in the process of doing it. So, hopefully, we get to share that today. And uh, already, we've shown you who the experts are. This is just a, a different um, uh, picture selection uh, as we go through it. We'd like to make some acknowledgments. Um, these people helped pull together information about this presentation. Um, uh, of course, we could just sit here and talk all day long, but uh, without images and, and videos to really show you what is happening, um, we're not doing exactly what we need to be doing to provide you with the best information. So everybody uh, on this slide, we'd like to acknowledge them and they helped, uh, we're an integral part in really helping to prepare this together. Equally, um, there are a lot of different references used. Um, these are uh, technical references, but also provided uh, detailed information about polyethylene use in various above ground situations and scenarios, uh, as well as good images um, to, to, uh, to prove the point that we're looking at. So all of these um, uh, resources are available to you if you wanted to uh, send us a note <coughs> and talk about it from there. Um, this is the overall agenda. So we'll talk first briefly about site pipe management. These are the things that happen on every um, high density polyethylene project. We really need to take a look to make sure that we don't damage the pipe in trip, uh, transporting and receiving uh, while moving it around on site. There's some smart things to do that we'll, we'll mention through. Um, talk about dragging potential pipe damage uh, and then show you some of those innovative productivity tools that have been, been uh, prepared and, and um, designed and, and constructed uh, to be able to make things easier on site. Uh, so a lot of times uh, pipe fusion can, can happen in very long runs in advance. And if we make it as easy as possible to fuse those long runs in advance for a crew, uh, the remainder of the crew can go on and do some construction work that is, uh, is useful that way. So here, um, Stephen, um, you want to come on and, and tell us what we're looking at from um, what getting the pipe from um, the extrusion facility all the way to exactly where it is that we need it to go. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Alan. Appreciate that. So, um, you know, pl plastic pipe typically is pretty easy to move around by trucks. Uh, a lot of it can go on a truck. Um, you know, the main thing is just how it's loaded and how you offload it. So there's always good information on that available from the pipe manufacturer and from the Plastics Pipe Institute and PE Alliance. Um, interesting note, though. So as you go larger and larger, as you can see here, this is an example of some 63 inch pipe uh, coming out and going to a job site. And for polyethylene, when you stagger it this way, you can get 90 feet of pipe on one truck. Uh, versus other materials, which may only be as much as, you know, 40 feet, typically two joints of 20 foot joints of other products uh, per truck. So you can tell right there, the number of trucks you have going to a large job site. Um, we had an example of one down in Houston, a project that was being designed that uh, cut the number of trucks by over 100 trucks needed um, to get the pipe down to that job site because you could do it this way. So um, a great Great demonstration. Every every pipe manufacturer has a truck loading charts, so you can see how many hundreds or thousands of feet uh, of each size pipe you can get on one truckload. Typically, you're limited by volume, not by weight, when you're dealing with polyethylene pipes, so you can get uh, quite a bit on there. Okay, great. Yep, there's lots of things to consider. Of course, more trucks means more cost in transportation, so uh, when we when we start to to get into bigger pipe, we really need to look at those those items. And of course, that's uh, bared by the contractor as an expense, but ultimately the owner pays for it itself. So thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, appreciate sure. that that uh, insight there. So when we look at uh, moving 
uh, for forklifts. We want to check those forklifts for jagged ends or burrs. That's going to damage the pipeline if it does uh, come in contact and, and jag that uh, pipe as we're moving it around. Uh, widest spread possible for those forks as we go through and lift in the center section of the pipe. Um, you want to operate as close to the ground as possible. Uh, and then well laid out um, job sites can, can lead to multiple productivity things. Um, obviously, Richard, if you want to come on and tell us what's going on in this picture on the right, um, not only are we having to, to uh, take over part of the road from an MOT standpoint um, to do the work, it looks like uh, at this particular junction that nobody's even allowed to, to, to ride on the protected side of the, the road there. What do you think, Richard? Yeah, that's right. Um, so this was a particular job on the right hand side there where you see the forklift going down the highway, um, taking old traditional ways of laying out pipe uh, in a job site. Um, they were spreading the pipe all the way down. We, we got there and we said, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, you can just create your whole uh, string uh, right in one location and then just pull that string down the highway, then you won't disrupt traffic. But uh, it's just old habits died hard. Um, and for us, for us, the real key is like uh, Alan mentioned is, is really you want to handle the pipe as little as possible. Steel against plastic, steel will win. Um, so planning your job sites effectively and efficiently, uh, we have lots of experience on that. Um, and even the McElroy group, you know, are building equipment to make it more uh, viable and more efficient uh, to make sure that these pipelines are put together uh, in a timely manner, but also in a safe and uh, um, less damage as possible uh, in, in regards to handling. So it is important. You can do it however you need to do it. There are some cases where sometimes you do have to move it around, but again, and unloading and moving and transport transporting pipe uh, is a little bit of a um, an art and 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 takes some skill because that one going down the highway is balancing on two forks uh, in our yards and like uh, Stevens yards as well we have great big long spreader bars that will hold that pipe in place because we're moving so much of it uh, in any given day so uh, just again planning and like uh, Stephen said we have information to help you with that uh, to help you plan your sites if if need be. All right. Um, one of the main reasons why trenchless projects are so productive is because they string out that long run in advance. Pipe bursting is a shining example of being able to to replace five, six hundred feet in one day in one run. Uh, and most of those projects are set up already with long longitudinal storage areas where they take full advantage uh, of, of these uh, benefits of polyethylene pipe. So storing is another um, uh, item that we look at uh, and it's important to be able to store these correctly. Um, there is uh, charts and other information uh, for storing heights uh, that, that are available to you for uh, within the Plastic Pipe Institute handbook um, on polyethylene pipe as well. They often have a spacer put between the, the pipes to allow room for that forklift to, to access that pipe. So uh, Richard, you have, have something you want to comment? Yeah, and it's, it's also important in your staging areas to realize that, you know, even with temperature change, the pipe will continue to expand and contract. So there's movement in that pipe and you can see the picture on the left. Um, you know, when you disregard uh, proper stacking, I mean, this is where damage can occur. And just imagine trying to get a forklift underneath some of those bundles uh, that is almost impossible without trying to stab at it and then potentially damaging and, and stabbing the pipe in the back. So proper stacking is important and uh, not only from a safety perspective, but a, again, a protective uh, perspective as well. Sure. Um, the picture on the left is a, is a well stored uh, photograph and the picture on the right is not so much. So I've never thought of stabbing a pipe in the back, but that's a perfect analogy, Richard. Thank you so much for, for that information. Um, dragging the pipe is very common. Uh, Peter, do you want to come on? You took the video on the right here. You could tell us what's going on. Um, there are things that we need to be cautious of when we do uh, drag the pipe, such as pulling it against soft surfaces that are not going to damage the pipe in any way. Sure, yeah, so that video that you're running on the right, that's down in, outside of Dallas. Um, so this contractor didn't clean the asphalt at all, um, Alan, and subjected the pipe to some scraping. Um, but it turned out, uh, you know, there are a variety of things he could have done. He could have put it on bales of hay, he could have used some of those low profile McElroy rollers, um, but he didn't. Uh, this uh, is a, you know, I think a poor construction practice. Uh, he should have done more to protect the pipe. But in actual fact, 
Alan, I know you're about to talk about pipe damage, but he didn't damage the pipe at all. Uh, he scraped it up. It didn't look pretty, but it did not exceed uh, even 2% of the pipe wall. And I think the, uh, I know the, the rule is 10% allowed, so. That's correct. Yep. This is a very common practice in pipe bursting and staging and moving things to a site. Um, and <clears throat> we'll help guide through um, different um, practices of bad, bad pipe damage and then, uh, you know, acceptable, acceptable pipe damage. So um, the 10% wall thickness is what is allowed. Uh, that in the field, you have to measure um, uh, with various mechanisms to be able to figure out exactly how deep that gouge did go. But one of the, the main accolades for um, uh, pipe durability uh, for HDPE is the fact that once you do have something that you consider to be a sub suspect uh, cut into your pipe or damage, it's easy to cut it out. So the, the scrape that you see on the right here is acceptable. Um, the scrape, the gouge that you see on the left, I determined to be not acceptable. Uh, and the contractor in this instance really just um, cut out this section of pipe, refused, and it only took less than 30 minutes to be able to do that. So when in doubt, cut it out. Um, and the malleability, durability of that pipeline will come in and save you at that time. So some of the alternate to dragging that we see here are also these rollers. Uh, many instances for large pipe, large diameter pipe, it's necessary to be able to make sure it's, it's properly cared for and then lined up uh, with the machinery in the appropriate fashion. But there are lots of tools available to you uh, to be able to make sure that that uh, you're not damaging this pipe as we go through. So we get into productivity as well. Um, I've been particularly impressed with the industry and how it looks at uh, making things easier. Uh, we'll talk a bit about this in Spotlight and Innovation too in a couple of weeks, but um, a lot of, of good tools have been made um, to make it so one operator, one equipment operator can fuse very long runs of pipe uh, in advance of uh, crew moving forward by themselves. Um, that way the remainder of the crew can come through and do other productive items such as exploratory work or other things of that nature. Doug, yes, you'd like to comment. Uh, no, I just came on early, apologize. Ah, that's all right. It's exciting, isn't it? It's good stuff. So we're really looking for a lot of that, uh, uh, the different ways to be able to make things easier and, and fuse up as much pipe in advance. So um, here's another, another uh, show of the productivity tools itself. And we're looking at larger pipe diameters, of course, and larger um, um, equipment to be able to come through and get everything together. So we also have mobile units, entrench units. So these are butt fusion uh, uh, items that you can take off of the, the rigging and get down in the, the trench to be able to perform that butt fusion as you go through that and see that. Um, and here's a, another video um, of multiple items that come through and do these item, uh, these requirements for you. So what yeah, you'll I'll, see on the- I'll, go ahead. I'll do that. So the one on the right is a, a Shannon Land from McElroy's taking that T900. So that's a, a large, it does um, almost a meter. So it does 32 inch diameter or so uh, um, butt fusions. And he's using the remote control to take it off the trailer and into the demo area where we were doing a road show. Uh, we're gonna show either one just like that or its cousin uh, next week, guys. And then on the left, you know, we talk about uh, productivity. Here we have you know, the classic fuse and, fuse and walk routine. And you notice on the left that that fusion machine is actually pulling the uh, pipe support behind it. Uh, so what they do is they do a fusion and then they run down the pipe string and do the next fusion. Really pretty exciting. Mike James gave that to me from MISCO down in Southwest part of the United States. Thank you, Alan. Yep, it's pretty cool stuff to see what, what everybody invents and comes up with to make uh, life a lot easier. So uh, we'll hand this part over to Doug. Uh, now we're going to talk about the above ground behavior, site pipe management's over. Um, so what exactly does this material property do above ground and how do we then move into uh, controlling it through installations? We'll cover Poisson's effect, thermal effects, uh, restraint, then, uh, of course, ultraviolet radiation and how the pipe handles that and then mechanical impact. 
All right, thank you, Alan. So the Poisson's effect um, is an effect of all materials, basically. So when you apply a stress to the material, it will elongate in the direction of that stress, but it will contract perpendicular to the direction of the applied stress. So one of the things I like to use is silly putty as an example. So here we have a piece of silly putty, and as I start to stretch it, you will notice that it starts to become thinner. So as I stretch it horizontally, it becomes thinner in the vertical direction. Um, so how does this come into play with polyethylene pipe? Well, when we pressurize the inside of the pipe, we're applying a stress that is now in the radial direction. So the pipe will expand in the radial direction. And because it expands in the radial direction, it is going to start to shrink in the horizontal or the longitudinal direction. So we need to be careful um, only when we're connecting to legacy bell and spigot systems or any type of a bell and spigot that we restrain the polyethylene pipe at that point of connection so that we don't have a chance of pulling material out um, of like say pulling the spigot out of the bell um, in the legacy system. Um, so again, you can restrain PE pipe in line with an anchor block. You can also restrain the unre uh, restrain unrestrained connections that are further down the line, depending on what works for your application. So Doug highlighted something that's very important because we get the question about restraint quite a bit, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But um, polyethylene is a monolithic system when it's all polyethylene, so you simply don't have to restrain it. But when we connect it to the legacy pipe system, that's when we have to look at this restraint because we don't want to pull that pipe out of its balance bigot system. So um, here, yeah. great, great commentary. Doug, you want to tell us what's going on with this, this slide itself? Yeah, so again, this is just what I was talking to on the, on the prior slide. So in the upper left, we, when we internalize the pressure, we are or internalize, applying internal pressure to the pipe. We are applying strain in the radial direction of the pipe. Um, so that liquid or whatever is forcing itself on the inside of the pipe. And what happens as we move to the right is that now, because we are expanding our stresses in, in this case, the vertical direction, the radial direction, we are now shrinking the material in the horizontal direction. Um, and again, that's just something that we have to take into account. It becomes a bit more of a factor in these at grade or above grade installations because the pipe isn't restrained by the soil like it would be in, um, in a buried application. So Absolutely. You, good, good. So now we'll talk about thermal effects. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, so of course, we, we need to look at and understand um, what this pipeline can operate within and then what happens uh, through changes in, in above ground temperature as we go through. So um, Richard, do you want to tell us what's going on? This looks more like your area in Calgary than my area in Florida. So you probably know a little bit more about it than I would. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, being a, well, Texas, I guess, had a little taste of this uh, a few weeks ago. So, um, but, you know, understanding that polyethylene is very ductile uh, in nature. So uh, as you can see by this uh, graphic, um, our ductility uh, doesn't become a transition to brittle until minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's pretty substantial. So, you know, I get lots of questions. Well, can I bend, can I still bend the pipe at minus 20 degrees Celsius or, or uh, uh, minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit? And the answer is yes. And that, but what happens is it just takes more force to bend it because it's, it's more dense. It's contracted on itself. Uh, but you can see it goes all the way up to 140 degrees where we remain ductile uh, is our operating range. So, you you know, when we talk about that operating range, that's quite a significant operating range. But for above ground installation, doesn't mean you can't operate in the winter. Whereas amorphous polymers are, are, are brittle all the way up to 121 degrees as demonstrated here. So, you know, our, our increased toughness, the larger deformations, especially when it gets warmer. Uh, we have to understand that and we need to understand that because as the pipe gets warmer, it turns into that cooked spaghetti as opposed to the, the spaghetti before you put into the pot. I'll use that analogy when it gets colder. Uh, but understanding it and realizing it will allow you to work in those conditions. Now, fusion conditions also change with that as well. So you have to be cognizant of what you need to do to ensure that you get proper uh, fusibility to create that monolithic system above ground. So it is very ductile in the ranges that we typically operate in human existence in North America. So uh, just be aware of it. As it gets warmer, it gets softer. As it gets colder, it gets, it gets stiffer. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Richard. And this next um, uh, slide that we have then shows a operating temperature multiplier and how it applies to operating it in warmer conditions. So naturally, um, uh, we are conservative as engineers. Um, a lot of water systems uh, tend to utilize a DR11 pipe, which has a 200 uh, PSI operating pressure that's conservative over the typical operating pressures of around 55 to 70 PSI itself. So if now we take and place that pipe above ground, we do have to derate it if it is operated in a warmer environment as shown by this graph as we go through here. Um, but I've also included the standard operating pressures for both uh, uh, pr potable water systems and obviously uh, gravity sewer systems as well. So even though we're derating to be able to be above ground in hot Phoenix sun or something of that nature, uh, we still have a significant amount of factor of safety covering that pipeline as we go through it. And in the buried applications, we were more concerned with the transition from above ground to below ground and what happens with a thermal constraint um, and, and expansion that way. But in above ground, uh, we do need to take consideration in hot environments what, what that pipeline might be operating within. Uh, so Richard, do you want to come back on and, and uh, to, oh, no, this one's mine and then you get the next one. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we uh, took a look of actual expansion um, for you through the Plastic Pipe Institute's in book, uh, handbook on polyethylene pipe chapter eight and did this calculation for a uh, change in temperature um, uh, from 70 degrees to 30 degrees Fahrenheit and how that affects its, its um, length. So this uh, calculation is, assumes that the length of the pipe is unrestrained, so it is allowed to freely constrict, and it uh, does drop, according to calculations, 3.84 inches um, over that 100 feet. But <coughs> a very important thing to note, these calculations and the formulas that are provided uh, assume an instantaneous temperature drop. Uh, that is not a realistic thing that happens. Um, and the Plastic Pipe Institute Handbook on Polyethylene acknowledges that and shows that actual field observations for this change uh, really show about half of the actual theoretical calculations. Uh, so of course, um, you're not gonna drop 40 degrees instantaneous. It's gonna be a more gradual thing. And also the change in length uh, is for unrestrained polyethylene. For other reasons, um, uh, we, for above ground installations, we would make sure that certain ends were, were restrained, such as the terminal ends where you're connecting to other pipe material or other apparatus. But the theoretical that is available is ultra conservative and that's exactly why. So um, one of the interesting things, Richard, if you can come on and help, um, at, while polyethylene does move, um, because of that coefficient of thermal expansion, the force actually required to restrain it is minimal. So go ahead and walk us through this one, Richard. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this comparison is just looking at a two inch DR11 to a schedule 40 steel pipe, 200 foot length with a Delta T of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and what's really critical and what we really understand about this is this expansion and contraction, especially just even in manufacturing. I mean, when we take it from 420 degrees Fahrenheit in a molten state and we turn it into a solid state, our pipe doesn't come off the lines at 73 degrees where we can have a 50 foot length. So we know that this expansion and contraction uh, uh, phenomena is very, very consistent, so we can rely on it. But in the piping world, where we have pipe that we need to understand how we connect to, is understanding the loads that are associated with this change in length. Um, and, you know, you can see here the difference in the in the forces that are applied or the stresses that are applied on the pipe are significant. So. We know in our design with our connections, our flange connections and our MJ adapters that, you know, being able to restrain uh, 321 pounds is really not a big challenge. Uh, so we can calculate that number. And if you understand what those stresses are, then you can avoid any kind of excessive stress or strain on that pipe uh, and, and understand that the fittings that we design for this change uh, will accept those uh, types of loads. Yes, so this um, concept here is explained uh, is exactly why 
when it's polyeth the system is polyethylene from all points of connection to all points of connection it is a monolithic system so that's very much going to be one of the main reasons why we do so well with soil displacement uh, uh, and other things of that that failure mechanism so um, this is a uh, very very clear to understand um, why it is that restraint, as we classically and historically think about strength, restraint within pipe distribution systems, <coughs> is different from polyethylene piped and bell and spigot. So you can see from this uh, rudimentary graph, all of these bell and spigot pipes, when there's a change in direction, when there's some type of a T or connection or other appurtenance, we really need to analyze um, the different methods of restraint available to be able to make sure that that does not move uh, to be able to pull out the bell and spigot pipe through it. Again, polyethylene is self-restrained. We do not need to worry about that except when we're connecting to legacy pipe systems. <coughs> so here we go with the various mechanisms of thrust blocks um, that are uh, capable for or available to you to be able to design your uh, high density polyethylene system. A butt fused wall anchor, as you see here, an electrofusion uh, flex restraint is something, something that can be electrofusion welded to the side of the pipeline itself. And we're concerned about pulling out that bell and spigot out of its uh, socket as we go through it. So construction uh, modifications on existing bell and spigot systems, regardless of the pipe material that you're putting in, if you were to put in a new appurtenance change in direction fitting or something of that nature, uh, that's when you would look to the agency's restraint table within its typical sections or typ typical details as they go through that. So that restraint table will lay out for you exactly how many sections of the bell and spigot pipe that need to be restrained. It's very common uh, practice uh, within the, the uh, construction industry to, to acknowledge that um, if you make another connection or a new, new um, uh, tap or something of that nature um, to a bell and spigot system, you're going to have to restrain that. So the polyethylene industry has is aware of this and created um, these different types of restraints for you to do so. Um, this is prior to, photograph is prior to pouring a, a concrete um, a thrust block through it. Uh, old practice um, of pouring thrust blocks was you had the the, the uh, concrete truck there already for you. You ordered it. A lot of times they would over pour the concrete around it, and then you'd have this massive block of concrete here that needs to be excavated uh, if you ever have to do something to this to this um, pipeline in the future as well. So um, that that's uh, not very good practice to pour too much concrete within it because then it becomes somebody else's problem as we go through it. Richard, would you like to add a bit? Yeah, just want to uh, just so for everybody online, uh, just know that the the there is a group working on a calculator for soil restraints as well. And when we talk about uh, as Alan emphasized, uh, unrestraint of uh, uh, calculations are very uh, conservative. Um, we're looking at what these different types of soils will, how it will restrain it, and we'll even determine whether or not you'll need restraint at all. So hopefully uh, that will be coming out this year, or we've been told it's coming out this year. So I really hope that that calculator will be there for uh, your use as well. And that's on the PPI um, uh, software uh, calculator. Thank you, Richard. Um, um, the Alliance is also available as a resource to you to look at fittings or other things that you have for your project. Uh, Peter, you took this video for the MJ adapter, which is a fully restrained uh, adapter itself um, created, invented by uh, famous Harvey Svetlick. Can you tell us what's going on with, with this um, video here? Yeah, so this was an open cut installation, uh, six inch diameter polyethylene going in an Austin Minnesota and the um, polyethylene um, mechanical joint adapters going into the valve. I mean, this is how easy it is to hook it up. And you can see the tracer wire is there, Alan. Um, this obviously is a, a below ground installation, uh, but this is an acceptable way that people use above ground. Alan, I've got an uh, installation. I've got a couple uh, statements and questions. One, Juan Quintero from McElroy says, hey, Peter, you got that video wrong. That was that uh, video that was on the left earlier in the presentation that was pulling a pipe support behind it. That was actually a, a McElroy T1200. So it does 1.2 meter diameter pipe 
uh, at a copper mine down in Chile. I've got a question, Alan, for you about pressure testing. Uh, this individual says, um, when should prep pressure testing be done ideally? In the evening, the night before? Uh, because uh, this individual doesn't want to have to derate the pipe. Could you explain that briefly, Alan? Yep, absolutely. So as the pipe heats up above ground, um, what, what is happening is there's slight expansion within the pipeline itself. So um, it can hold more makeup water within it. Uh, pipe, uh, HDPE pipe is fully <coughs> leak free when properly fused. So you're not going to lose any water through a pressure test, but the pressure test as it's uh, historically for the legacy systems that have a leakage rate, um, that makeup water is going to, to throw it off because you have a larger expanse. So typically in Florida suns, I would pressure test first thing in the morning as opposed to the afternoon and you avoid that problem. Great. Uh, I have one additional comment um, or statement. Hey, any latest feedback on polyethylene piping system performance or failure anal analysis for on-ground pipes during the winter storm in the USA? I've received no information about any polyethylene failures uh, throughout the United States. Um, in fact, our uh, winter climate, northern climates, Canadian, uh, Minnesota, Alaska, polyethylene pipes have not been any failures that I know of uh, this year. So um, good news for us. Uh, typical news for other piping systems. Back to you, Alan. All right. Thank you for that uh, helpful, helpful um, uh, insertion there, Peter. Really appreciate it. So above ground behavior, what we're going to talk about now, I'd like to pull Doug back on for this picture of this frog. He didn't take it. He's not a, a masochist that way to, to animals. So, but we're going to talk about uh, ultraviolet radiation. Yeah, so obviously the concern when you're having pipe above ground is what are the effects of the sun on my pipe? Uh, the picture on the right is, uh, for, is pretty familiar with anybody in a sunny climate um, for a competitor's material. What you're seeing here with that browning is actually a process called dehydrochlorinization. Um, it is a breakdown of the material that's started by the UV energy and then is a self-propagating uh, breakdown of material. Once you start this, that will continue. If you put that pipe in the, brown, in the ground, it doesn't matter. It will continue to degrade. The good news is that polyethylene doesn't have that issue. And the reason for it is that we use carbon black. Um, as you can see in the picture at the bottom left, that's a mixture getting ready to go into the extruder of the natural polyethylene material and the carbon black concentrate, the center one being an indication of the car concentrate. What we shoot for is at least 2% of carbon black in the final pipe. Um, and that gives an indefinite exposure time to UV radiation. So you're not going to see polyethylene pipe changing color, not you're going to see black polyethylene, you won't see black polyethylene pipe changing color like you do here with the, with the competitive material. Next slide. So how does carbon black protect from UV radiation? Well, if we think of the carbon black as individual molecules of carbon, which is what it is inside the pipe, and we zoom in on the pipe when it's being hit by the, by the radiation, what happens is that UV ray comes in, it hits the carbon black, and there's enough carbon black in there that the carbon black changes that UV energy into vibrational motion. So in, in area number two, we now have these carbon black molecules that are vibrating. But because they are in a polymer matrix, they are constrained in place, they cannot vibrate significantly, so they transfer that vibration to heat. So we take the UV energy coming in and we convert it to a little amount of heat that's being generated, and that's how we stabilize polymers with carbon black. And this is a very common thing that we do. Alan, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, before that, when, uh, okay. when you pr provided this slide, I loved it because I met, immediately imagined the little particles of, of carbon black just vibrating like this. Of course, it doesn't take much to make me excited, but that was, that was fantastic. And of course, the proof is in the pudding here, Doug. So go ahead and let us, let us know where, where all that carbon black uh, analysis came from. Yeah, so the, the minimum 2% was really uh, developed by Bell Laboratories, which was the research arm of, the, of our tel telephone companies, Ma Bell. 
Um, and what they found was that when you get up above 2% and in that 2 to 3% range, you really do a very good job of stabilizing the material. And of course, Ma Bell was looking at it from the extent of telephone wires that are up in the air, exposed to sunlight every day. Um, and the proof is really there because since the 1950s, we've been stabilizing polyethylene materials with carbon black, using it to protect telephone lines and the telephone lines are perfectly fine. So when you ask, okay, where's the proof? Well, find a telephone pole. You'll see the proof. All right, I definitely appreciate that insight, Doug. Thank you so much. We're gonna look at how these pipes then are used for mining operations, uh, landfill operations, um, some California usage above ground, and then inventory yards. Um, so one of the one of the things about polyethylene is once you're installed and you're committed to it, you see little failure. So there's not a lot of need to carry in uh, polyethylene in, in your yard, but uh, there's still other items that the Alliance is working towards to, to provide you with a, a information on what as a minimum should be installed. Uh, this picture here is from ISCO in, in a mining operation. Essentially, they move pipelines and refuse them across the yards um, property as they harvest natural resources from one place to the other. Um, and these pipelines are in fact refused multiple times um, and subjected to UV radiation as they're above ground. So uh, mining operations use that HDPE for uh, water, slurry, power cables, air supply and return. Um, many, many different types of things that they're harvesting have significant uh, corrosion uh, within that, that harvested material. So HDPE is a natural uh, choice for corrosion resistance of what they are harvesting. And again, these pipelines are refused multiple times as they move across the property um, for that mining operation as we go through. Very unique um, in landfill applications, the poly is used in two different um, methods, two different ways. So since the early 80s, um, the landfills uh, understood that polyethylene was one of the best uh, mechanisms to do containment liners. So at the very bottom of that landfill, uh, we're sealing up exactly what we're putting in there as they don't want any of the chemicals that could be contained into that hazardous waste to leak through that liner. So adoption of high density polyethylene pipe has been used very early on for this, for its strength, flexibility, chemical resistance, and all those things that we know are good for it for buried pipe installation. But that's the same type of thing that really makes it so what we're trying to keep within the confines of that landfill or right there in that landfill and not leak out hazardous chemicals to do it. Within that landfill industry, they expect the uh, HDPE liners to last well in excess of 400 years. And they are looking long-term because the operation uh, of a landfill itself is a longer term period. Richard, would you like to add? Yeah, just want to make clear to everybody that those liner sheets are fused together as well. That is correct, absolutely. Another application that they used is to harvest the gas and the leachate and any, any kind of chemicals that happen within that landfill. <coughs> so we're looking at vertical well pipe, horizontal well casing, headers, and lateral pipe material. Um, the mass within that landfill itself settles and changes direction. So if we're looking at settlement within the landfill, obviously high density polyethylene that is self-restrained is going to be one of the best materials possible to be able to deal with any type of settlement um, within that landfill itself. So these processes have been proven for some time uh, and, and HDPE is widely used in landfill applications. <coughs> the San Lorenzo Valley in California. Hey, Alan, before you, yes. before you get started talking about San Lorenzo Valley, uh, Mike Whitehouse just piped in and said, pun intended, um, he has clients, he's with ISCO Industries, that he has clients in the Arctic Circle that are using polyethylene above ground. Mike Whitehouse, I need those photographs and in next year's show, we will include those for sure. Um, so San Lorenzo Valley is an interesting one, Alan, because um, our one of our colleagues and that's a competitor loves to 
say, oh, your pipe burned. Uh, you must have a terrible pipe and we got you covered on that one. Well, guess what? When we have forest fires that are burning in between 2,500 and 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, every pipe type is going to suffer, suffer if not burn completely or lose their gaskets or somehow fail. Uh, polyethylene failed in this instance. Uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District chose to use polyethylene on the forest floor 26 years ago. Uh, they made that decision. Their, their engineers were aware of the downside. And guess what? A fire came through in October of 2020, burned the polyethylene. But what pipe, Alan, did they put back in place to support their municipality? Polyethylene. Exactly right. Okay, so we look at inventory yards. Um, this is a photograph from ISCO of a larger um, inventory yard that is, is uh, maintained by them as a distributor. As I mentioned previously, most municipal users that have adopted 100% HDPE for their system or installed large, large amounts of it um, don't have failures. So they don't need to keep a whole lot of stuff within the inventory, but there are some fittings and other things that we need to, to keep to make sure that if you do have a failure, you're able to successfully uh, attribute that or address it. So legacy pipe uh, historically needed large covered areas in order to be able to store that pipeline. <coughs> and that coverage, of course, is, is costly for your municipal yard and not necessary with high density polyethylene. So fittings, uh, it's important to keep electrofusion fittings sealed within the bag. Those obviously would go within a covered area. Um, targeted repair fittings such as the cross grip, uh, Krauss grip and the Versa um, and this uh, um, Georg Fischer multi-joint uh, can be used. Uh, in many instances, as you see here in this bottom left, um, these fittings would save the day. This was a one pipe in, one pipe scenario, out scenario of a, a bridge that failed through that and the, the um, repair procedure was simply to throw this fitting upon it and, and it works uh, well that way. So those are some types of uh, fittings that we would keep for the, the treble scenario. Yes, Peter. So a lot of, we get a lot of questions you know, on the above ground stuff, Alan, but we also get questions on how do you fix this stuff? And I say, well, it doesn't break. Yeah, but I got an example where it did. So somebody came in and damaged it. Polyethylene, you fix it the same way you fix other stuff. Just take one of those Krauss Versas or a grip or the George Fisher multi-joint and put it around it. Treat it as a band clamp or use that ductile iron clamp that you're very familiar with. Put it on the polyethylene, but just know that you need to come back to fix it and make a permanent repair. We do consider that the blue or the red up there, Alan, to be a permanent repair. That's how sophisticated these clamps are these days. So buy a couple of these, keep them in the shop. And then when a third party comes in and damages your polyethylene, you've got a way to fix it right away. That's correct. Yeah, you know, the, those water main breaks or the damage from the contractor don't happen on 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning after you're done with your coffee. Uh, they normally happen the night before Christmas or something of that nature too. So yes, you need to be able to be prepared to fix it at any time. So when we do install pipe above ground, uh, we do need to have some type of a damage mitigation plan. <clears throat> You're not always going to fix for uh, people or other accidents that happen, such as what you see on the right picture here. But it is important when we install pipeline in traffic areas to go through and go ahead and start thinking about that. Um, Stephen, did you want to come on and, and talk a little bit more about uh, potential mitigation plans and what we're really trying to avoid uh, when we're looking at above ground installation of PE pipe? Yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, there we go. How's that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is our, our responsibility and requirement to be able to to uh, to make sure that we're protecting the pipe and the the general public. Yeah, correct. I mean, that's that's right. I mean, there's uh, there's lots of things. The nice thing about polyethylene is it can take a lot of da or a lot of uh, I won't say damage. It can take a lot of rough handling and still uh, be just fine. So as you've demonstrated earlier in some of your other uh, slides, um, you know, what happens if you do damage it? But, you know, when you are laying pipe out in these areas, you do need to be careful for, you know, traffic considerations. 
and other types of equipment or things that, that could damage it as it's being put into place. So um, there's, there's a host of ways of doing that. Um, you can see here on this slide that uh, we don't recommend you drive your uh, uh, tractor over it, um, which that's not what's happening here. Um, I know it looks like the wheel of that tractor is sitting on the polyethylene pipe, but it's just it's just holding it. The bucket's holding most of the weight and it's just holding it down into the ditch as it's being pulled in. So again, um, just make sure that you, you know, make sure that you have traffic areas um, that you can move the pipe around uh, carefully and that you can pull it in these long lengths certainly helps. Yes, so the, the, the equipment operator knows the exact extent of this. And this is a, 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 as far as where his equipment is positioned and how it's supported. This is just another mechanism to use uh, larger rubber tires to be able to directionalize the pipe. Now that you know, we talked about this picture a good bit in preparation of this presentation and that's, that's what we've come to there. So thank you for that contribution, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Um, sure. Now we move into above grade installation. Um, so some real common, of course, is above at grade temporary uh, and then at grade permanent, we'll talk about more as well. So we'll look at bridge abutments or bridge um, uh, piers and then also anchor design itself. You're seeing a temporary water bypass system on the right here that basically moves throughout the neighborhood to support a pipe bursting project. Um, the service line connections are subsequently tied to this pipe. Uh, as that pipe bursting operation moves forward so people could still stay in water. <clears throat> Temporary water and wastewater services during construction um, sometimes can be more challenging than the actual pipe rehabilitation project itself, uh, spe specifically with large diameter pipeline. We just want to make sure that that temporary bypass is protected, which is what you see here on the right. Uh, so there's ramps to be able to make sure that when cars drive over this, they're not damaging that pipeline. This is reusable. Uh, and so is the polyethylene material as you go through it. So you can have 2000 linear feet of this temporary bypass, uh, and then you just refuse it, disinfect it, and move it along as you go through the system. <coughs> So potable water does require that disinfection and gravity sewers do require a submersible pump to be able to span wherever you're working through and move it around as we go. So that two inch HDPE service line can be reused as I said. Uh, this is a, a lay down yard as to which they're flushing and fusing the smaller two inch poly at the same time that they're flushing and fusing the larger uh, 600 foot runs um, of an eight inch poly as we, we see here. So it's that ductility and resiliency of that material that allow it to be repeatedly used. In wastewater, we can get pretty creative as to how we drapes this pipe through the service area. Um, they have released valves still are necessary in order to be able to release any accumulated gases as we go through there. So this is what you see here is a fitting with a temporary air release valve um, and then also some protection of that pipe as we go through a storm sewer pipe to be able to make a crossing. So the contractors can get pretty creative as they go through. Um, for the next one, um, this is a unbelievable case study on the city of Baltimore bypassing a 78 inch uh, pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe and they installed CIPP uh, and CFRP. Um, I'd like for everybody to come on for this one because this kind of culminated the entire um, entirety of this presentation is as we looked through it. So it, um, they did install CIPP and carbon, uh, carbon fiber reinforced pipe. Um, we of course would like to have had it as polyethylene job, but um, the, the temporary bypass really is the, the shining star for it. So there was only 4,700 linear feet of 78 inch that was rehabilitated, um, but they needed 45,000 linear feet of 24 inch HDPE to make this happen. There were three 24 inch and two 18 inch fusion machines going and the, by, the main bypass capacity was 156 million gallons a day. So to frame that for you appropriately, that serves as about a quarter of a million people. 
you simply can't tell a quarter of a million people to stop flushing the toilet. It doesn't doesn't work that way. It is a lower low pressure uh, bypass, but um, there's a video next, uh, and we'll play the video and then talk about this as we go through. That really goes through everything. This is a Sunbelt rental bypass project that was highlighted in Trenchless Technology Magazine. So Peter, you had this as a case study. Can you tell us a little bit more about it as well? Um, honestly, Alan, I just gathered it. I don't really know much about it. Um, I've seen the video like you, so I, I, can't, I can't help you. Okay. Um, yep. As we saw before, there's 45,000 linear feet of that, that pipe material that came through um, to be used as HDPE. So Richard, there's flange joints that are shown in here, um, the temporary valves. They don't seem to be restrained in concrete. Uh, why might that be? Yeah, well, the flange joint itself is is restrained and it's restrained through the flange adapter. So uh, because you have a total um, high density polyethylene system, uh, it is restrained. Uh, it is restrained at that point, but you don't you're not protecting it against any kind of uh, legacy connection of a bell and spigot. So it's technically allowed to move. So if it moves, it moves and, and, it, and it'll move and that's okay because uh, as you can see in those elbows and in the flanges, um, there's no restraints there because it can manage, it can handle the pressures that it was uh, designed for. Uh, but if, if the temperature changes and expands and contracts, it's just allowed to move. And so that, that flexibility, literally the flexibility is an advantage because they don't have to worry about um, you know, putting anything solid and concrete in there uh, to hold it or restrain it because they're going to be removing it over time because it is temporary. So it's a beautiful example of, of you know, the, the, the diversity of, of high density polyethylene. Doug, yeah, I just, talk to I, I'll be chime in on you there, Richard, too, is, you know, there's so much going on in this video. I mean, you got the flange adapters, you have butterfly valves on each side, you have you know, ductile iron fittings thrown in there when they didn't have, you know, something available that they needed. You got fabricated fittings, elbows, 90s, uh, 45s, uh, T's, um, you know, all these things are available for underground as well, as you, as you can imagine. But, you know, it shows you that the whole system's there and available, and it's all the different things you can do, the special headers you can have made. Um, it really highlights a, a lot of attributes of a, of a well-designed polyethylene piping system and everything you can do with it. So guys, we got a question here uh, from someone who shall remain nameless. What is the maximum recommended design velocity for above ground conveyance systems made out of poly? Yeah, um, pending the temperature, uh, I mean, that's, you have to take the temperature into consideration, but at 73 degrees, we can tell you that um, a maximum of 25 feet per second uh, is a number that you can look at. So, um, but as you get higher, of course, your polyethylene gets softer, you can derate that a little bit, but just be aware that, you know, that, you know, when, if you have a surge event, because that's where your water hammers become critical, um, and, and your change in velocity, but where we operate in the water and sewer systems, I mean, you're lucky if you ever see 10 or 12. Um, so, um, it's not really a concern, the velocity at all. Yeah, but Richard, aren't you going to get the higher velocities? Aren't you going to get more pipe movement? Uh, you could get a little bit of vibration, but again, uh, again, uh, being monolithic and being self-restrained, um, it's a real concept that, you know, the, the viscoelastic behavior of this polymer and able to hold hoop stress, uh, it can move. It's allowed to move. So don't be afraid of the movement. Just understand what it's going to do. Uh, and we can always help you with that, depending on the details. And like Stephen says, there's a lot going on here. And there was a lot of design considerations that they looked at, and they had a lot of confidence in the, in the uh, viscoelastic or the ductility of this product to make sure that they didn't have leaks or failures. All right, uh, Alan, I'm so glad and I, you know, I'm just delighted that Sunbelt produced this video to demonstrate the capability of above ground polyethylene. I mean, it's a, it's a winner. Um, hey, Alan, we got 10 minutes left. I wanna respect our audience and um, I'm gonna stop asking questions unless we have some more uh, responding to these questions, unless we have some more time. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Uh, now we're gonna talk about above uh, grade installation for permanent scenarios. Um, I really appreciate um, everybody's input to date and we're still gonna have some more, I'm sure. So <clears throat> some of the reasons to install above grade are ease of inspection and maintenance, 
um, challenging access for construction equipment. We want to make sure that we're expecting what you're putting that pipe on for rocks or point loading scenarios, uh, uniform bedding material itself. Uh, we do recognize that that pipe is going to snake or wander as the temperature changes as we go through it, um, but the terminal ends will require that restraint as we look through this, uh, if you're not going to, to restrain it in between. So there are several different mechanisms to do this. Um, uh, Richard, do you want to come on and talk about um, the different things that we're seeing here with, with uh, uh, lateral deflection, expansion loops, and anchor to guided systems just briefly before we- Yeah, exactly. Um, so conventional expansion loops are uh, really common in uh, landfill applications where these pipes are above ground. And so they, they take into consideration, instead of worrying about the pipe moving back and forth, let the expansion loop take it. Uh, a lot of the other anchoring systems are really protecting roadways and stopping this thing from shifting and moving out into the middle of the roadway. And if you just need to control it, if you just want to control it, um, and again, understanding that expansion and contraction coefficient of this product, and you can literally calculate what that what that movement will be and how much you need to uh, control it. Okay, great. So now we are looking at different methods here. So um, earth berms, either continuous or intermittent, need to have about half of the OD on top of that pipe and a minimum of one OD for the top of the pipe from a wide standpoint. We're really looking for rubber padding with uh, any type of a anchoring system or, or that you may be putting into place. And we're really looking at a maximum permissible strain that's allowed uh, as pr um, per the uh, polyethylene handbook on PE piped is 5%. So in the areas that you are restraining this pipe, uh, that's where that strain really uh, can develop. We're working through an example here for you for a, a comparison of 50 foot and 100 foot intervals of restraint for a 10 inch uh, DR11 pipe. Uh, we are looking at a 50 degree temperature change. And again, remember back to the earlier on in the discussion where the temperature change were were uh, being run as instantaneous. It doesn't happen that way, but at 50 foot intervals, that deflection will be 26.8 inches between it. That's a lateral deflection. And the strain developed when the pipe is 1.11%. So it's well under that 5%. Now for a hundred foot uh, restraint areas, we're looking at 53.7 inches of lateral movement and a strain of 0 0.56. So you really need to look at where that pipe is above ground, uh, what it could potentially embrace into um, and decide where you're going to try to restrain that. So we look at HDPE on bridges and piers. Uh, there are so many different mechanisms to be able to, to support this pipeline. Uh, and we do understand exactly how to calculate that support pipe system. So with that strain and the stress, we want to keep it within that 5% strain limit. And together, it's not only a deflection due to the pipe weight and weight of the material that you're conveying through that pipe, but we also need to look at lateral movement, uh, the strain that's developed through that. And you can cradle underneath the pipe and it won't sag uh, in those areas. It'll just be allowed to move laterally. So we are looking to avoid pockets or sumps, interference with other pipes if they are mounted on the bridge. And we'll talk about support uh, spacing as we look through it. So uh, we're looking at center to center span length. Uh, that is um, calculatable, and we have an example coming up, and load per unit length, so that's that weight of that pipe in between those spacings, and then we'll do a beam deflection analysis based on limiting that deflection. So PPI does provide a maximum allowable bending stress as one half for non-pressure pipe and one eighth of that operating pressure. Uh, so this is a conservative assumption that they have to be able to make sure that that uh, allowable stress uh, doesn't exceed those parameters itself. Then we look at calculating uh, the weight of the fluid and the weight of the pipe for the point loading and actually look to a deflection that is a measurable deflection. So these are the calculations that are available to you within uh, um, chapter eight of the polyethylene handbook on, on PE pipe. And now we're looking at a 12 foot restraint interval. 
and calculating the actual deflection itself for a 10 inch DR11 pipe. Now, again, we're allowing 100 PSI bending stress, which is conservative in its assumption, uh, but the deflection due to the weight of the pipe and due to the weight of the water within the pipe, we calculated out as only 0.0002896 inches. So not very much at all. Again, that's cumulative with the thermal expansion. If you support it on the bottom and in a cradle, you can allow some of that pipe to move if there is a, a large change in direction. Um, so here are some uh, anchor and support designs. Uh, again, there's lots of different things that are available um, for different support designs. And we'll show you some examples here in a few minutes. Um, should be one half of that pipe diameter for uh, the cradle support to support 120 degrees at the bottom of that, that uh, uh, pipeline itself. Again, they should have no sharp edges or burrs. Uh, heavy fittings or flanges that, that are installed on that pipe above ground um, should be uh, have one pipe OD on either side of it that is supported as well. So the cradle, as you can see here, 120 degrees is shown on the bottom left of the pipe. Rubber parts are, are placed between those metallic parts and HDPE to make sure that you don't wear that pipeline down. Um, and anything that is designed as a support should be stout. Uh, so it should be able to make those connections and hold uh, the pipe stress through that you see as well. So here's some specialty designs. Um, I'm not going to talk through many of these, but a lot of people that ask about uh, designs itself that we look at um, don't know of the litany of available options to you. I believe this is um, a brochure pulls from Maverick uh, specialty uh, fittings as well. So there are a lot of things that are available to you to support your pipeline above ground and the information is there. Uh, so I'd like to bring everybody back on. Um, we're, we've got about three minutes here to address any additional questions that might happen, have some closing closing uh, arguments as well. So uh, All right, thank good you guys job. so much for your participation. Yeah, great job. I got a question. Are there any references for aerial crossings of canals, bridges uh, with spans of 80 to 120 feet? So the, the calculations um, within the Plastic Pipe Institute Handbook on Polyethylene Pipe Chapter 8 would provide the guidance for installation, for deflection, um, and thermal changes, if so. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times for bridge designers, which is where a lot of information on this type of installation could come from, they're more concerned about the actual structure of the bridge, uh, more so than the protection of the polyethylene pipe or the utility. So the best information that is available to you for the behavior and protection of the polyethylene pipe is going to be chapter eight of the, the PPI installation handbook. Okay, so you can, you can buy that hard copy of the book at PPI's website or from me, it's about $60, uh, or I can send you, or PPI can send you a PDF of that book and or chapter eight by just sending us an email. Also, uh, if you want a copy of our engineer's package, uh, send uh, me a request and I will see that it gets sent out to you. Um, I have uh, another question here. Um, what is the modulus of elasticity for polyethylene for wave speed, wave speed calculations? And what is the inside surface roughness for the Darcy friction factor calculations? Um, I can take the modulus. Um, so we do have, we do understand that the modulus does change over time and depending on the application. So the instantaneous modulus value is 150,000 PSI. Um, and it can go down to 50 year type uh, values down to about 28,500, I believe the number is. And we have charts in uh, the PPI handbook as well for that. Uh, so you can understand what those modulus are. The Darcy number, I'm not, I can't remember. I know what the Hazen Williams factor is, but I don't know what the Darcy number is. So Hazen Williams is 150? Correct. For the life of the pipe doesn't change over time. Um, Doug Keller, any closing comments? Um, I guess one thing I just wanted to point out on, the, especially for the Sunbelt installation, um, when you're doing above ground, uh, as we talked about with mining, a lot of those applications, you'll then cut up that pipe and use it somewhere else. So if that pipe hasn't been damaged, if it's been handled properly, you can cut up that pipe, move it to the next job, fuse it together, 
and go on. In the case of the Sun Belt, they look like they were bringing in fresh pipe, new pipe. But you can definitely, if you don't gouge that pipe significantly, you could cut it out, move it to the next job. So thank you, Doug. So uh, Richard, Mike Whitehouse just chatted me and said that those higher speeds are used in mining applications to keep the slurries in suspension. I uh, never really considered that because my focus is water and wastewater. Yeah, absolutely. And you do need those higher speeds. And, and the, mining, the mining industry is unique because they're, they're moving aggregates. So aggregates within, um, within the piping system itself can cause abrasion. So you need to understand that and even the design of them. But yeah, it's, it's important. And yeah, those velocities are heavy because they, they, you need to keep that, that, uh, that particulate in suspension so you don't uh, drag it along the bottom. Stephen Boros, how about you? Um, on which part, just in general. So yeah, closing remark. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a really good presentation. Um, you see above ground applications all the time and people are always concerned about it because they say, oh, you know, the polyethylene, it moves a lot, high expansion, can thermal contraction. Um, and the nice part about it is it's so easy to mitigate. I mean, so yeah, while it does have a higher coefficient of, uh, thermal expansion, um, it's much, much easier to mitigate than it is with any other product. So you get a fully restrained system. So you don't have to worry about it most of the time. Um, it's really makes it perfect for a situation like this. And it's extremely tough, as you can see here. And as Doug mentioned, you can move that pipe around and reuse it somewhere else. Um, it's just kind of interesting how Alan said earlier, you know, people always like to use polyethylene for the most rigorous and most, uh, uh, a difficult project and then they want to go back and use something else for easy stuff so I, it's going to work for the easy stuff and the hard stuff i remember um talking to an engineer out west uh, she was from oregon and the first week she was the chief engineer for her utility uh, they were doing a polyethylene job and the contractor uh, had been out there for like a week and the weather had stopped them and uh, she got a call from the police department because a piece of pipe, a 24 inch piece of pipe had been resting unrestrained on the top of a pipe stack and it got really hot that day and that polyethylene stick walked down the county highway. <laughs> it <laughs> fell off the deck and she, she'd had a bad taste in her mouth about polyethylene ever since. Um, she needs to show up at this, at this talk when we do it next year. I wanna thank our panelists, great job today. Doug Keller, Stephen Boros, Richard Colossa, and particularly you, Alan Ambler, fantastic job. And with that, I'll turn it over to Drew Mueller. We'll see you all next time. And thank you for your patience and thank you for your support of these long form webinars. Drew. Thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks to all our presenters. Guys, this is a program people have been asking for. I'm happy we finally put it together. I'm actually gonna be able to answer people's questions better after sitting through this. So thank you all very much. To our guests, here's our contact information. If you have a, a request for the engineering package, a copy of the uh, presentation today, please shoot me an email, dmuller at pepipe.org. But all these guys are happy to answer uh, any further questions you may have that we didn't get to today. Uh, so as always, we're very happy to have everybody in attendance. We will see you next week live from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Take care, everybody.